That worked. That quiets everyone. Hi, everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, if you're still standing, I encourage you to sit. It's going to be a very engaging panel, so don't walk out. Uh, Hi, uh, welcome. Um, we're so glad you all are here today. My name is Ona Balkas. I'm a staff attorney at the Food Law and Policy Clinic here at Harvard Law School. For those of you that don't know, uh, clinics provide action-based learning opportunities for law students uh, to get real-world lawyering experience before they go out into the real world. And at our clinic, our students are working with nonprofit organizations, um, advocacy groups, government agencies to improve the food system in their communities. We have an excellent panel of experts here today to talk about how recovering nutritious food that otherwise would go to waste is a key strategy to achieving food justice. Um, to my immediate left is Emily Broadleib. She is my boss and the director of the Harvard Food Law and Policy Clinic. In addition to teaching and writing about food law and policy issues, she is recognized as a national leader in the legal and policy efforts to reduce food waste. Doug Rao is the former president of Trader Joe's and has gained national attention for his much anticipated store, The Daily Table, which will be opening in Boston next month. Uh, Doug has been a long-term client of our clinic, uh, and we are proud to be supporting his innovative efforts um, in food recovery. And Sasha Purpura is the executive director of Food for Free, a Cambridge-based based nonprofit that recovers fresh food to distribute to those in need. In 2014, Food for Free recovered 1.5 million pounds of food and served 25,000 individuals. Food for Free has recently begun an exciting partnership with Harvard University Dining Services that we will hopefully hear a little more about today. So my role is to briefly uh, help us understand the scope of this problem. So in the United States, between 33 and 40 percent of the food we produce here goes to landfills. Um, this problem is only getting worse. Between the 1970s and today, food waste has increased in the United States by 50 percent. So why is this a problem? Well, uh, first, uh, one in six Americans are food insecure, meaning that they can't afford the type of nutritious food that would enable them to live a healthy and active life. And we know that the most commonly wasted foods are fruits, vegetables, seafood, exactly the type <coughs> of nutritious foods that are also um, sometimes hard to afford uh, for low-income families. Food uh, is also um, the largest component of municipal solid waste. It's the largest uh, part of what goes into our landfills. As it breaks down, it produces 25%, uh, 23% of US methane emissions. Uh, we also dedicate 25% of fresh water in the United States uh, to producing food that we never actually eat, not to mention significant amounts of petroleum, pesticides, and other chemicals. And as we've talked about a couple of times today, climate change will disproportionately affect um, poor communities. So all of these environmental repercussions are very directly um, connected to food justice as well. So uh, I am now going to turn it over to our panelists who are going to describe their diverse innovative efforts to increase food recovery. We were, are going to leave ample time for questions, and we hope to have a thoughtful and lively debate. Thank you. Hi. So as uh Ona said, I'm Sasha Perpura, and I'm the executive director of Food for Free. Food for Free is a nonprofit. We're based in Central Square. Now, for over 34 years, we basically go around to retail stores, uh, retail food stores, whole wholesalers, farmers markets, and we collect a lot of really good, healthy, edible food that would otherwise go to waste, and we bring it to the folks who most need not just food, but access to healthy food. So we bring it to food pantries and meal programs, shelters, um, youth programs, serving over 25,000 people. So food waste is bad, right? It's, it's not good to waste food. And where we can control it, we should control it. And one of the places we can control it is at the consumer level, where a tremendous amount, it's actually shocking the percentage, which I don't have, of food waste that comes at the consumer level. We can control how much we buy, eating leftovers, how we store it, et cetera. But I would like to suggest that at at scale, at other levels, surplus food, extra food that could potentially go to waste is inevitable. And I want to talk about 
a couple of scenarios. So first, let me start with a farm, and I'll talk about a small New England farm, because that's what I have experience on. If a farmer sends three of his staff out to pick beans for an hour, and they come back, and the numbers will be wrong here, but say they have 100 pounds of beans, and he takes those to market and sells those and makes enough money to pay the, that labor for collecting those beans as well as some profit. The next week, maybe he sends those three staff back out to the beans, and in an hour, they come back with 80 pounds because of the life cycle of the plant. And maybe the next week, it's 60 pounds. And at some point, it doesn't make sense for him to send people out to pick every last bean, because at some point, the money he's spending on the labor is going to be less than the money he earns on the small amount of food that they're collecting. So it is inevitable that on small farms in New England, there is going to be food left in the fields. What is not inevitable is that doesn't have to become food waste. So there's a group called Boston Area Gleaners that can go out to farms after the harvest and they bring volunteers and those volunteers go out after the farmer's done and they pick every last bean and they bring it to food for free or to a food pantry or to a shelter. So there is going to be, and it's not, you know, the farmer isn't going to be able to do anything to run a business and make sure he picks every last bean, but it doesn't have to be food waste. If we look at supermarkets, so Whole Foods is our largest retail food donor. We, we go to four Whole Foods stores on a daily basis. They are also a business, and they have to make a profit. And to make a profit, they have to satisfy their clients. And their clients have certain expectations and demands. For example, when I go to Whole Foods, I want to get, well, when anybody goes, typically in this country, we expect to be able to get what we want when we want it, right? So it may be a tomato in January, but it may just be if I go in, I expect lettuce. And if I go to Whole Foods two weeks in a row and there's no lettuce, I'm going to stop going to Whole Foods. So Whole Foods has to have a lot of lettuce. Because additionally, I don't want to go in and see one head of lettuce. That is a turnoff to a, a purchaser. When I used to sell at the farmer's market with my husband, we would come in, and at the beginning of the market, we'd have this huge pile of beautiful bunches of beautiful orange carrots. And in two hours, all but one bunch would sell. And literally, in the next four to six hours of the market, that last bunch of carrots never sold because people don't want to buy the last bunch of carrots. So Whole Foods needs to have lettuce and they need to have a lot of lettuce. People want to pick what they want and they don't want the bruised apple or the bruised lettuce. And then additionally, if I purchase lettuce from Whole Foods, I certainly don't expect that it's going to start to wilt in two or three days. I want it to last a week. It may not, but if it doesn't, I may have problems with Whole Foods. So they can't sell me that lettuce if it's not going to be good for another five, six, seven days. So Whole Foods is in a situation where if they want to stay in business and serve us, the population, they have to make sure they always have everything on their shelves that it's full and that they're pulling it off if it has sat for a couple of days. That is inevitable to run their store successfully. And they can, you know, they can limit that and they can reuse some of that food to make prepared foods, but it is inevitable that they're going to have extra food. What is not inevitable is that that has to be food waste. So every morning, we go to all the Whole Foods stores and they load us up, particularly with produce. Produce is perishable and it is one of the most wasted foods. In this case, we're not wasting it. It's perfect. It's one of the top foods that folks, food insecure families need. It's the most expensive food. It's food they can't access in certain neighborhoods. So the fact that at the farm level and at the retail level, there is all this produce available, this is a positive thing. It absolutely should be limited because there are costs associated with producing it, but it's going to be there. The third example I want to give is a university. So as Ona mentioned, Last year, we started a partnership with Harvard University. <clears throat> they, their dining services serves 14 dining halls, and I believe it's about 138,000 meals a week to students, buffet style. And if any of you have ever had a large Thanksgiving dinner, there's typically leftovers. It is really hard, the larger you get, to exactly know how much food to make. And just like at Thanksgiving, you, if you're serving it and you're bringing a bunch of people in, you don't want people scraping the last bit of mashed potato off that plate. If I'm Harvard and I have students that have paid to eat all semester and they come to a later lunch, there can't be two french fries and a half a ladle of soup. They expect to be able to eat what folks ate earlier in the day. So they have done a tremendous job at limiting and at, at predicting and at understanding how much food to prepare, but it is inevitable that they are going to have extra food at the end of each meal. 
So of that 138,000 meals, we pick up approximately 2,000 meals a week. That's a small percentage of waste. However, that is enough to feed about 100 people three meals a day for an entire week. And that's fantastic. We take that food and get it to folks who live in motels and don't have access to kitchens or who are homeless or who live in single resident occupancy. There are a lot of people out there and we're about getting nutrition to folks who need it. If it's produce, they've got to cook it and in many cases they can't do that. So now we have this Harvard surplus food that we get to give to these folks. Um, the, the point I'm trying to make is surplus food is inevitable, right? There, there is something called food waste and that is bad. And I am not advocating overcooking meals, you know, making too much food intentionally. What I am saying is that there's a reality to running a society at the scale at which we run this one. And one of those realities is there's going to be surplus foods at these larger scale institutions. And that, that doesn't have to be a problem. That doesn't have to be food waste. That's actually a solution. This isn't solving the core issues of food insecurity, which have to do with pov poverty and jobs. And those things need to be addressed. People should be in a situation where they can buy their food. But the reality is many, many people are not. 45% of the children in Cambridge schools are on free and reduced lunch. That's almost half the kids. So the reality is they're not. And in the meantime, we have this incredible solution. It's not only preventing a problem, which is food waste, but it's creating a solution. So the last thing I want to bring up, and then I will pass this over to Doug. When I was working with my husband on his farm, and he was trying to create a farm and make a living as a small farmer in New England, and that is not an easy thing to do. And sometimes at the farmer's market, people would comment on the price of his unbelievable tomatoes and he would get frustrated because this is the cost of food. And I saw this tension between the need to grow our local food system and to pay farmers a fair wage and the issue of food access because I care deeply about our local food system and about hunger and all I saw was this tension. When I joined Food for Free, it was fantastic and I discovered there doesn't have to be this tension. So one of the things that we do in the summer is visit 11 farmers markets at the end of each market. Now say my husband breaks his back harvesting, brings everything to market, loads it high so it sells, and it starts raining. And nobody comes to market. And at the end of a long six to eight hour day, he's not too happy and he's got a lot of greens or that one bunch of carrots left. Now he can load that all back up into his truck, but he doesn't have a market until next week. So he knows if he loads it back up at the end of a long day where he's already discouraged, he's gonna have to load it up, drive it home, and it's either gonna go to pigs or chickens or compost or maybe a few neighbors and he's gonna eat a lot of kale. Instead, he can give that to food for free, as do many of the farmers, and it helps them in terms of ensuring that their food doesn't become food waste but becomes a solution. It helps them in that they don't have to load up this food that now does not have value to them, and it helps them in that it enables them to help build up our food system and contribute to this issue of food insecurity with some of the healthiest, freshest food that people can eat. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Well, first thanks to uh, Emily and to Harvard for this opportunity to discuss what I think is a really critical issue. I. Uh, I promise not to do death by PowerPoint, but because a picture is worth a thousand words, I wanted to give some uh, pictorial context to some of these issues. So first, let me run through. To me, first thing I learned in my awakening about this, spent 35 years in the food industry. As Ona said, I spent 31 years with Trader Joe's, 14 as president. And I saw food throughout the chain being wasted, whether it's on farms, whether it's manufacturers, retail, wherever it was. But when I graduated from Trader Joe's, and I had the opportunity to do a two-year fellowship here at Harvard, and I started studying this issue, I was really looking at it from the standpoint I was getting in the mail from Feeding America, I think they mail things out four times a day uh, to my house, uh, that one in six people in America are hungry. They're hungry. And it's like, how can this possibly be? I mean, we're the richest nation in the history of the world in food production. Food is now a third less expensive than when I started at Trader Joe's in the mid-70s. So even though food is so cheap in America now, 
it's really cheap compared to what it was just even in the 70s. So not as a surprise, when something is ubiquitous and it's not expensive, we tend not to value it as much. So one of the first things I had to do was the awakening of what's the real nature of the problem. If you want to solve a problem, you got to understand it. So there's nothing worse than trying to answer the wrong question. So I thought hunger was a shortage of calories. And it definitely is with part of the population. And much of the population that uh, Sasha was just talking about is in desperate need of the services that she's providing. And the food banks at the soup kitchens around America uh, are providing. And that's not just what Food for Free does. They do a lot of other things, too. But there is a part. This, what I want to say is that I'm very aware that there are people in America to whom a shortage of calories is a, is a reality. But the one in six that uh, are mentioned as being hungry, food insecure, the vast majority of those actually get enough calories. As we'll see, that's not really the issue. So for me, the next big awakening was to come to this. that You've heard about one in six Americans. This is the part that gets interesting. If you can get all this stuff you can get off of USDA, right, and all the ERS and all the other data that's out there, you, can, you know, drown in it. 61% uh, of food insecure are what's called basically food insecure. They're not very food insecure. They're people that make the wrong nutritional decisions due to economics. So if Bill Gates wants to eat poorly, it's not, he's not food insecure, just to be clear. But if someone has to give their kids sugar water, as Mark Bittman would call soda, uh, or liquid candy, I think he calls it, uh, or you know, chips and other junk in the morning, because that's the only way to get the calories they can afford, then that's a type of food insecurity. And what we discovered, of course, is that then I think it's 39%. I, I love this, I'm trying to remember what the numbers are now. Is it, uh, 38, 39 percent are very insecure. These are people that struggle with you know, missing meals during the month at some time. It doesn't mean that 39% of the people every day don't have a, one of the things if you go on the website and you read the definition, it's really about during a month at some point, did you go without food? Now, any of us that have ever gone without food for a day know that, you know, even a day is, is tough and particularly for a kid. Here are the things that when we talk about food justice that to me are really important. So the first is that when you talk about ethnic groups, Black, Hispanic, one in, more than one in four. It's actually 26, 27%. So it's one in four food insecure. And then of that, I don't know if you can see this, one in three, it's 34.8% of low income. So now you got a third of low income families in areas around the country that are food insecure. Now, this is to me a chart. I say I stole this from Jonathan Bloom, uh, many of you know. Uh, and we were on a panel together, and I loved it. This is hunger in America. This is the evolution of man in America in hunger. Because it turns out hunger isn't a shortage of calories. It's a shortage of nutrients. And when you know that, then the solution to the majority of those one in six are working poor. The majority of those one in six are getting plenty of calories. The problem is they're getting the wrong calories. They're getting empty calories. They can only afford to eat things that uh, have been stripped in nutrition. So. Here's, again, you've seen these obesity maps, I assume. If not, you can Google it on CDC's obesity maps. Not now, they'd be rude. But, uh, <laughs> and it goes by year from 1985. So I didn't want to bore you with the stuff. I'm going to give you the punchline. This is 2010. 1985, by the way, 25 years earlier, not 100 years earlier, one generation earlier, not a state in the nation was yellow or light orange or dark orange. Not any state, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, was more than 14% obese. Now we're looking at obesity rates higher than 30% in one generation. So what's happened is that this one in six that are food insecure, for the first time in human history, hunger and obesity coexist in the same community and same person. So if you're going to solve a problem, you better know what the problem is. And the problem, it turns out, for many of the food insecure, the majority, 61% at least, is affordable nutrition, is what we're talking about. Getting them fruits, vegetables, dairy, protein, compared with you know, empty calories, fast food, junk food, et cetera. Now, 
I also stole this slide. I was on a panel for uh, Partnership for Healthier America last year in, uh, down in DC. And the gentleman who runs the largest cooperative of food service groups in the United States called Marcon, it's about a 25 to $30 billion uh, uh, business, they're the cooperative. He had this slide. He's headquartered in Northern Cal in the Bay Area, and he said, this is Salinas, California. This to me is exhibit A about what we're talking about. This is a field of lettuce. The interesting thing about this, you know the punchline already probably is, this is after the harvest. What's up here is about to get plowed under. And why is it gonna be plowed under? Exactly as Sasha was saying, what happens is they go out and measure when is it that the average head of lettuce is at the exact right size? When is the maximum number of lettuce at the right size? Why? Because this lettuce, as has most romaine lettuce, is grown for a bag. You know, you all have gone to the store and got those three packs of lettuce in the, you know, Earthbound or, you know, Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, any of the brand names. And if you notice, the top is intact. It's the, it's the, it's the whole plant, including the roots, so that, you know, it's not chopped off at the bottom, the leaves haven't been trimmed. And as a result, nature doesn't grow things perfectly. So some are short, some are tall. The only thing wrong with this food is it's too small or it's too large. That's it. The other reason, of course, you may know, and that's this one right here, code dates. And Emily and her team did magnificent work with the uh, NRDC, put out the report called The Dating Game that has to deal with the challenges that we face by the confusion over display codes being mistaken as expiration dates that sell by and best buy are completely confused by the customer at home as thinking, oh my God, I can't use it after that. So this is one of my favorite ones. And do you know what the code life of honey is? Forever. It's like forever, right? <laughs> So this product says Best Buy October 2nd, 2015, if I'm remembering right. <laughs> there are probably 99% of Americans, that if this was on their cabinet, they look at it and go, ooh, it's October 3rd, I can't have this. Now I better throw this out. I don't, I don't, I don't want to put my kids at risk. I, can't use, I don't want to use expired honey. So this is just, an, to me, these are examples. Another example would be we're up at the Chelsea uh, Farmer's Market just introducing ourselves and we're going to be coming around looking to see if you have any excess food that it's not being utilized, and they said, would you bring your truck today? No, we're just saying hello and stuff. Oh, that's too bad. Why? Well, we have 7,000 pounds of mangoes. Oh, what, what's wrong with the mangoes? They're almost ripe. That's what was wrong with them. They're almost ripe. Can't ship them to a store at this, this rate, you know, because they're almost ready to eat. Yeah, got to waste those. So this is, this is what we're talking about. This. So now, Daily Table is really designed around tackling a part of the market that I saw the food banks weren't tackling. And this came out of, again, Harvard and research and talking to Vicky Escara, who is the CEO of Feeding America, and discovering that the number one issue, or one of the key issues, is this one right here. And it's the issue of, well, to me, it's dollars, not distance. It's the fact of it's affordable nutrition, as I mentioned, not food deserts in most of and much of America. You can put a Trader Joe's, a Walmart, a Target, a whatever you want on every corner in America, and many of these one in six could not afford to buy produce, dairy, or protein. So it's not so much accessibility as affordability. The other one is this one right here. So when I talked to Vicki Escara, she said 38% of our clients that are eligible for our services, won't use them. And why won't they use them? Dignity. Large percentage of the population, particularly that are the working, uh, you know, that are at the economic uh, lower strata, they don't want a handout. They don't want to feel um, that they're, they're being held up. They want to have that feeling, I can provide for my family. And so dignity issue is really a big one. So when I was trying to think of, well, what if we're going to come up with a sustainable solution as a society of how are we going to feed 49 million Americans on an ongoing basis, uh, and we're going to get them affordable nutrition, right away we got a problem because the entire food system from the farm bill on down is designed around cheap calories and expensive nutrients. You can start with high fructose corn syrup and everything else. But it's, it's tough to find ways to have a sustainable system that's designed around affordable nutrition. So 
Daily Table is designed around the idea that, well, if we can go out and help try to recover some of this wasted food. And by the way, Sasha and Emily have heard me say this before many times, but I actually think we would all do ourselves a favor and anyone that's in this by never using the word food waste again. Because food waste is food as a modifier of what type of waste is it. And waste is something sanitation departments are designed to handle and they do a good job of it. But nobody in America wants a second helping of food waste. No one. However, if you take those two words and flip them, nobody in America thinks it's a good idea to waste more food. So we're talking about wasted food, food that's excess, that's healthy, that's mangoes that are almost ripe, lettuce that's the wrong size, food that's at its sell-by date, but has another week or two weeks or more, honey, et cetera, that are at its sell-by and display codes. So we're talking about healthy excess food. This is a lot of what the issue is about. So daily tables design around going around, what can we do to collect this, bring it down to a retail store, and then offer it for pennies on the dollar. So the reason we're selling it is twofold. First and primary, it's because customers have told us we want to shop. We want to be able to buy things. We don't want to hand out. If you're just giving us stuff, you know, we're going to embarrass walking in the store. If you're selling us something, I don't care how cheap it is. It could be, you know, bundles of kale for 10 cents. It could be, you know, quarts of soup for 99 cents, chicken soup or whatever it is. It, it's okay, but we're buying it to treasure hunt. We want to do that. So that's one. The second, of course, is that Cornell's done a bunch of research that shows if you can get someone to choose something, they'll use it. School cafeterias, put an apple on a kid's tray, it goes right in the trash, almost invariably. Get the kid somehow to pick the apple, high percentage of usage. So the idea is, can, at retail, can we nudge them towards, through demoing, through sampling, through information, can we nudge them to try things and eat a diet that, that's moving them towards a healthier outcome? Um, the third, of course, is it provides then this issue right here. So there's a question of no time. Economically challenged is not, when you're poor, you're not just poor economically. You're short of time. All of America suffers with a sor with shortage of time. I mean, virtually, that's why more meals are eaten outside of the house now than they're eating in. But as you move down the economic pyramid, it's tougher and tougher and tougher. And so in the focus groups I've done down in the inner cities and in the many, probably 30 meetings now between churches and neighborhood meetings, et cetera, this issue's come up over and over again. We don't have time. You know, yeah, you're gonna sell, you know, you can have all this wonderful produce and things, but you know, we're getting off a bus at 6, 6.30 at night. We're tired, kids are hungry. I can't go over and buy a bunch of stuff, take home and cook. I'm expected to walk through that front door with dinner ready. So if it's a big awakening to us, change the whole model of Daily Table from basically a grocery store to competing with fast food and competing with uh, grab and go meals. Come in, we'll cook stuff up. Most of Daily Table is actually a kitchen commissary. We recover food, cook it up and have it then ready to come in and grab and go for meals, take home and eat. Can't eat there, and the reason's very simple, we want you to eat with your family, we want you to eat at home. Uh, a lot of research on that and, you know, for reduced drug use and gang participation and stuff, if families that eat together. So, this one's 75%, that's the number I learned at Kennedy School during my fellowship, that's the percentage of the executive director's time, maybe not Sasha's, but executive director's time that's spent in fundraising in America. Because if you're a nonprofit, fundraising is the air you breathe. And to me, I didn't want to build a model that had to have so much energy and time raising funds for a mission, no matter how pure that mission was. And, and you know, I would say, in all honesty, there's not a food recovery or hunger relief agency I know of that doesn't have a phenomenal mission. The challenge for each of them then is funding. So the idea of Daily Table is. Well, first of all, if I can find some way in which we can, get, we can get revenue by delivery of mission instead of for delivery of mission, then to some degree, I'm not competing with the dollars that are out there. And those that are out there don't have to look at me as competing and taking money out of the charitable pool that, that's already out there. But just as importantly, it allows me to try and do scalable work. So Daily Table did a partnership with Codman. It opens April 14th. Uh, it's on, down in, uh, uh, actually on four corners in Cobbin, right where they meet in that, that area of Dorchester. It will uh, have a teaching kitchen. It will have a retail floor, a lot of, a lot of kitchen space where we prep and do stuff. Um, and then this is where we have 
children after school. There's a picture, by the way, this isn't, this isn't Daily Table, I wish it were. I hope <laughs> it will be. Uh, but we have already a number of schools lined up and signed up for uh, bringing kids after school for programs they are free to learn about nutrition, to learn about education, and feed them at the same time. So last photo for me is I think that all of us were gathered here because the really big picture to me <laughs> is that we owe it to the food's a precious resource. Whether you look at it from the environmental standpoint, you know, and, and what happens with wasted food and greenhouse gas and the water we're wasting and stuff, or you look at it from the human side, that we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our kids, we owe it to our grandkids, to make certain that we're utilizing this precious resource in such a way that everyone, everyone, every kid in America ought to get an opportunity to be their best, to neurologically develop, and to have access to affordable nutrition. Is this mic on? Oh, good. Okay. Um, okay. One moment. <coughs> uh, anyone? I don't know where my slides are, actually. <laughs> I thought they were going to be on here already because of nether rooms they were. Do you know? I'm going to do it with no slides. That's okay. I think it's food as a means of justice, probably. I was just missing a word. Yeah, there we go. Okay, good. All right, perfect. I was actually ironic earlier. I said, don't want to, maybe I'll just get rid of my slides. So then I <laughs> had a moment of panic when I thought I actually didn't have them. Uh, thank you so much. Of course. Uh, so I'm going to start while this is getting loaded up here. Okay, perfect. Great. OK. Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm really excited. I'm always excited to be with such inspirational people on a panel who are out there every day pounding the pavement, getting this amazing, high quality food, and making sure that it gets to people in need. Um, and the role that we play in this space is really trying to figure out what are the, the laws and policies that make this hard. I mean, this is important. That, you know, we're, we're getting food from farms and farmers markets to people in need in many different ways, some of it for free, some of it for people who are able to purchase it in a setting that is providing them with dignity in all these great ways, but there's a lot of laws that actually get in the way of that. Um, so I'm gonna skip this because I wanna explain what we do a little bit, but just reducing this work on reducing food waste, improving options for food recovery is one of our key areas. Um, and I think just to start here, because a lot of times people think, well, where, what is the role of law in this space? Um, and actually, there's a lot of impact that our laws and our legal system have on attempts to both reduce food waste and particularly to improve options for food recovery and get food to people in need. Um, and, and part of this is, is, is sort of across uh, all of our food system, I think. It's that we've been doing business as usual for, for so long and you know, treating our food as this, this you know, cheap thing, as Doug talked about, it's our food today in America costs less than it's ever cost in any country in any time. And because it's so cheap, we throw it away. We don't treat it well. We, we don't think about the people that don't have it. We don't make great decisions. And so this is just one area of that context where I think our legal system has developed in not, not forcing people to make better choices and, in fact, not allowing people like Doug and like Sasha and others who have creative ideas to use those creative ideas. Um, as one example, current laws really restrict opportunities to innovate. Um, and I'm going to talk about in a few examples of these exact policies, but this is something we've been working on. How can we encourage more Dougs and more Sashas to be out there being innovative and make that possible and say, um, you know, it's great when food makes, it to, makes its way to food banks, but there's still a lot of food that's getting lost around the edges and getting wasted and not being used in ways that are sustainable. 
our laws fail to incentivize um, the reduction of food waste. We don't have, there are some incentives, which I'll talk about, but we don't give people, we don't say to people, um, if you reduce your food waste, if you get it to people in need, if you go that extra mile or spend that extra, you know, uh, little bit of time to make sure that that food gets to the right place or to get someone to your farm to glean it, we're not giving people enough rewards to do that. And so we're not making it possible or easy. Our laws fail to penalize people making unhealthy choices. I know it's crazy to think that we would actually hold people liable for wasting food, but in a way it is, in a way it's not. I mean, we're throwing away this very valuable resource that we've spent a lot of, of you know, water and oil and fertilizer and pesticides to create, and then we just throw it away as if it's nothing. And laws also could help to scale up some of these successful experiments. So if we find things that really work, if Sasha's me method of getting food from these different places really work, we can create a policy system that makes that possible. So these are all these ways that law, I think, is an overlay of all of these things. Um, so I want to just talk about a few examples of things we're working on in this space, and hopefully to give you a sense of how, as people interested in this topic, you can be advocating for things that would make this more possible. So I like to start with this picture, which uh, this this sort of um, upside down pyramid, which is created by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and it is meant to to give us a sense of. Um, how best to use our food resources. And I think it's really important. I mean, everyone knows that landfills are at the bottom, right? That that's the worst place for, for food to go. But I think actually, as we're thinking about how we can put in place policies or organizations that try to address and reduce food waste, that we stay at these top levels. So I think both people mentioned this. We don't want more food waste, even if it's really great food. This, you know, the, the food that, that Sasha's picking up from Harvard or the lettuce that Doug mentioned, the, the two short lettuce um, from the field, we don't want more of this. The first thing we should do is reduce at the very top and realize that this is a valuable resource and we want to be more thoughtful about how much we're producing and um, making sure there's not extra of that. And then if we're not doing that, we want to be feeding hungry people because people, you know, there's so many people in need, this really matters, it's really important. And then beyond that, feeding animals and, and so on. And I think that a lot of the laws we have in place right now aren't thinking about this. They're not sort of remi remembering that we want to start at the top of this pyramid and work our way down. So I want to start with our work on date labels, which, which Doug mentioned. And actually, we got started in this work in the first place after I met Doug and started to hear about the work he was trying to do with Daily Table. He said, we want to be, you know, we, we want to sometimes be able to use food that's, that's close to or at its date, but the laws won't let us do this. And we said, well, what, why would the laws not allow that? What are those dates? You know, what's going on with those dates? What do they actually mean? And we embarked on several years of research that brought us to this report. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we found. Um, so basically, every group that had been looking at date labels as a, a driver of food waste said, Date labels are causing a lot of waste. Someone should really try to understand exactly what they mean and how we can make them better. Um, so this was a challenge that we took on, and it's a great project for a legal clinic because it's looking at laws. Um, and so let me tell you about our findings. So the first one is actually probably the most surprising to people, which is that date labels are really undefined in law, and they're just a suggestion by manufacturers of when a food is at its peak quality. So for those of you who might have thrown food away, I won't make you raise your hands because I imagine most hands would go up. If you've ever thrown food away because you thought that you or someone you were feeding it to was going to get sick after that date, that's absolutely wrong. Those dates have nothing to do with food safety. There's no safety tests that are done on the foods. Um, if companies do any testing at all, it is just taste testing. So they'll have people eat them after one day, two days, three days, so on. Then you know they'll find the date where most people start to say it didn't taste as good as you know I, I, it tasted yesterday. And then to be overly protective, they'll set the date even a few days before that just to make up for you know shipping, storage conditions, etc. That's if they do anything. Some companies. Um, don't, don't really do testing, they just pick a date and put them on there. And there's really no law behind that. No one's enforcing, no one's telling companies how to set that date or not. So I mean, it's funny to be at a conference about food justice and thinking about this. There's this frame being put onto all of our food that we're all just following like lemmings and throwing our food away on that date over and over again, rather than actually thinking about it and saying, that date passed, but it tastes totally fine. 
um, particularly for shelf stable foods and like honey, which Doug mentioned, many of these foods, there's really no date. You could eat them forever. Vinegar, bottled water, these have dates on them, but they, nothing happens to them. Bottled water will always be water. There's no change going on within that water. Uh, as well, there's no federal standard for expiration dates, and that sort of ties into that first point about dates not being defined in law. Um, so that's what we mean by this. There's really no federal law that defines them or requires them or requires them to be created in a certain way. And in fact, the Food and Drug Administration has chosen not to regulate dates because they've said, these don't have to do with safety. We care about safety. These do not have to do with safety. Therefore, they're not within our mandate. Um, so this is really important. And the next thing we found, which is, which is quite interesting, is that the federal government doesn't regulate, so states have stepped in and regulated. And these show two maps. This was a big piece of our research, just looking at what states require with regard to date labels. Uh, so many states, 41 states, require that at least certain foods bear a date label. And again, this is, they have nothing to do with safety. It was, you know, as consumers got further and further away from their food supply, further from the farm, consumers said, we really want to have dates on our food so we'll know when we should eat it. Um, we want this indicator. And states took up that charge and they put, you know, they put together all these regulations. What's most interesting about this is that the state regulations are totally different from one another in terms of what they require. And then the second map shows then there's 20 states, including Massachusetts, which actually restrict the sale or donation of those food after the date. So let's think about that for a moment. We've just said these dates have nothing to do with safety. I think the poster behind it is oh, falling down. Oh. <laughs> Someone's very angry about this. I am also angry. Uh, OK, so we've just said these dates have nothing to do with safety. But then you have states like Massachusetts saying, we're going to require dates on all foods that are perishable or semi-perishable. Any food that's, that would go bad within 90 days is required to have a date. Other foods can have dates if they want to. And then we're going to make it really difficult for you to sell the food or donate the food after that date so that the bulk of that food is winding up straight in the, in the trash because there's nowhere else for it to go. Uh, and I think as well, it's, it's helpful to think about what some of these differences are. I'll just give an example of milk because it gives, you know, tells you how crazy the system is. Um, so uh, some states require that milk has a date label a certain number of days after the date of pasteurization. In Pennsylvania, that's 17 days. And in Montana, it's 12 days. 12 days after pasteurization. There, there, there's not a different climate between the two of them. There's no reason for that to be. It just points to how absurd this is that these dates um, you know, aren't really linked to science. They're not really linked to safety. As one other example, I've said already, Massachusetts has some of the strictest requirements for dates. By contrast, New York, the state of New York, which has New York City, which is a very big city, doesn't require dates on any food. And New York City used to require date labels on milk, and they got rid of that in 2010 because they said, this doesn't make any sense. This date label isn't linked to safety. It doesn't make anyone safer. Our state doesn't have any requirements. They eliminated it. So I think this is really important to keep in mind. And I know um, sometimes I get into this place of, you know, Obviously, the foods that have expiration dates on them often are packaged foods and processed foods, but they're also the foods that we've put the most energy into creating. We, we took them from the farm, we transported them somewhere, we processed them, we cooked them into something, we put them in a package, we spent refrigeration energy to, to hold them in a store, and then we're just going to throw them away because these dates that are unclear. Um, and this just, just to give evidence, this is actually a study from industry that shows uh, when, no matter what the label is on the date, whether it's used by, sell by, best by, expires on, enjoy before, which is one that, that uh, Doug and I've had laughs over before, um, people throw those food away. 90% of consumers have said, I throw food away at least sometimes on the date just because I'm afraid of safety. So this is really impacting the way that consumers are using that food. Um, so this really gets to why, where law and policy comes into this. Um, so we've said the federal government does not regulate, states do, but not based on science. And even in those states that require dates, they don't require that the label be something specific. They don't require that, uh, that there be any method behind the setting of those dates. They're just saying, we want all food to bear these dates on them. And what you wind up with is very confused consumers not just primary consumers, but also food banks and food recovery organizations who don't know what they can do with that food and either are restricted from giving it away or don't give it away because they want to really make sure that they're keeping people safe. So what we're pushing for is really a consumer-facing label that would be 
that would make sense, that would be standardized, that would help people understand this so that we can avoid the amount of food that we're wasting. Um, and in preliminary focus groups that we conducted with a colleague at Johns Hopkins, we found that the term freshest before actually was made the most sense to people. When you think about it, you know, use by, it sounds like, what will happen if I don't use it by that date? Uh, so, you know, some of these other dates, people get really confused. And freshest before made sense to people that this was about quality, that if it were after that date and it, used, it still tasted fine and smelled fine, that you could eat it and you wouldn't get sick. It was just your choice. Do you, you know, do you want to make a commitment not to waste food or do you want to, you know, use it in some way after that date? That's up to you. Um, and you don't have to have fear that you, you or your family are going to get sick. We also think um, for this small, like 1% of the food supply where there actually might be some risk, and these are really foods like deli meats that um, could be previously contaminated, and because we don't cook them, they actually could increase the amount of listeria contamination if they are previously contaminated. So this is a very small group. We're not telling anyone about those risks either. Let's make that really clear. The system we have isn't really serving anybody. Um, so those could have a separate label. And there, there's a very small list of those. FDA knows what those foods are. Let's tell people what those are. And let's allow the sale and donation of food after this date. Once we put a label on it that makes sense, once we can educate people, then we don't have to worry as much. We don't have to have all these people getting concerned and throwing that food away. So that's one big one. I want to talk about one other. We've, you know, these are two other areas where the law is really important. But I want to talk about one because it's sort of something that I think ties into our discussion and is really timely right now. Um, so. Uh, going back to this this hierarchy, so I think expiration dates really impacts both source reduction because it means we're throwing away less food out of the food supply um, before it even gets to people or in people's homes, but it also impacts getting food to people in need and feeding hungry people. Another way that, that the law impacts our opportunities to feed hungry people is in terms of the protections for food donors and the incentives for food donors, and this is some new area that we've been working on. Um, so. We've talked a lot about this, how many people are in need, but if we redistributed just 30% of the food that we lose in the US along the food chain, that could feed all of the food insecure Americans every single meal that they needed. So, you know, as, as I think Doug talked about, people, they're eating something, they're just not getting enough, but we could, we could feed them their entire food supply just by redistributing 30% of the food that we're throwing away. Yet, only 10% of food is recovered in the US. And this is for a lot of reasons. It's because of liability concerns, which I circled there. Um, the, you know, companies, they want to do their business. They want to do business as usual. And they don't want to give food to someone with the fear that maybe they'll get sued. So this is huge. We have really good protections in place. But we're not getting that message out to people. We're not encouraging them enough. And we're not making those protections. They actually could be broader and protect even more. That's one thing we're working on. The other big issue is cost. And this came up a little bit just that Let's say there's a farmer that is on that last field of, you know, of beans, as Sasha talked about, uh, and it doesn't make sense for them cost-wise to send their laborers out to pick those beans and get them to market. Um, so we need to give them an incentive to help cover those costs. And there, that, this is an area that we've worked on around tax incentives. At the federal level, there actually is a tax incentive to, um, that would pay a food donor for, do for donating that food. The problem is this incentive right now is limited to only the biggest corporations. It, for many years, it was expanded and it was it was open to anyone. So farmers who are generally not big corporations, um, you know, small mom and pop stores and restaurants were able to get this incentive. That has expired, and there's actually an attempt right now to get that expand to get that incentive back out there. And I think it, it comes up a lot. I think about it a lot in the in the in the context of farmers because farmers often, especially small farmers, are working at such low profit margins that any extra money that they could get to support those, that extra field of beans that got to people in need will help them to continue growing beans and growing things to get those to people. It's fresh food, it's healthy food. Often it is getting wasted in the field for reasons that we heard, which are not very good reasons. They're not linked to safety. They're not even linked to, to expiration data or having been on a shelf for a while. It's really just the economics of getting it to the people in need. Um, so that's one issue is just that only C corporations right now are eligible for this tax um, deduction. The other big issue, and this goes back to the point Doug made about, about um, making some of these food recovery efforts sustainable. A lot of people have good ideas right now about how they can get a revenue stream, and there are people who want to pay and are willing to pay 
some amount of money for these foods, or there's some way to process them into something that people would buy. But right now, the tax incentive goes away if that food, if any money changes hands. And I think that this is sort of a, um, an old-fashioned way of looking at food waste and food recovery, thinking that everything has to go through a big food bank to get to someone in need, where, in fact, there's a lot of opportunities for innovation, for new models that we, we could be encouraging and allowing if we said, we want to get this food to people in need, and we're going to really incentivize new people coming to the table to do that, new businesses, farmers trying out new models. Um, so this is something that we've been working on. And several states have state-level tax incentives. We've worked on that. But I think really at the federal level, there's a lot we can do. So the other area I'm not going to talk much about, although I'm happy to mention it if people have questions, is around liability protections. I think the biggest issue here is really that we have some great ones in federal and state law, and yet every single corporation that is not donating food has said it's because of their liability concerns. So we have an awareness problem, we have an education problem that not only can they donate this food, but that we as consumers don't want to shop at companies that are throwing away all of their food instead of reducing the, from the source or getting it to to people in need. I think there's a lot that we can do there. And so here, this is new work for us. We're working to better understand the barriers, to increase awareness of laws and protections like those liability protections, and then to align the policies so that we can try to figure out how to get to a better future where we're not wasting 33 to 40% of the food that we produce in the US. So with that, I'm excited to have a conversation and to hear your questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we're going to open it up to questions. We'll use the mics that they used in the keynote. Uh, as people are getting up, I'm going to ask the first question. So uh, you can walk slowly to the microphone. Um, so uh, in a very timely way, Molly Anderson, our keynote speaker, um, said something to the effect of, and I'm paraphrasing, um, poor people don't want your food waste. Uh, and uh, it was very timely because this was actually my first question anyway, but she really gave us a punchy sound bite for it, which is that there is this, this pushback about, um, you know, if that recovering food that wealthy people, quote, waste to distribute to low-income communities, is that insulting to communities? And uh, I'd love to hear the feedback on that statement from our presenters. Um, sure, so I'll start. So. Food for free, it was really fascinating when I joined. I joined just over two and a half years ago. We've been around 34 years. And I came to learn that a large part of our staff over time, and even currently, are recipients of the emergency food system. We have this tremendous volunteer base that rides the trucks and helps our drivers that basically, I guess, another form of dignity. They want to work all day to sort of take that food home. But food for free wasn't. Um, it's not wealthy people giving anybody their food waste. It is people in the community saying, hey, look at this insane thing that's going on. Why is that stuff going in the trash when our community could use it? And they are stepping up and collecting that food and eating that food and sharing that food with others in the community that are helping to make sure those who need it get it. So it was. It, it, I think for Food for Free anyway, and, and these models have been successful even where that's not the case, but certainly in the case of Food for Free, there's nothing about outsiders giving poor people food waste. You know, It's people in a community making a sensible decision and saying, hey, look at that. I'm going to get it. I'm going to use it if I need it. And I'm going to share it with my neighbors, and I'm going to work with the, and, and the stores similarly. My husband wasn't rich, still isn't. Farmers aren't rich. The folks at Whole Foods that are giving us that food are not rich. I mean, this is a community of people that are working together to solve a problem. And at least in my experience at Food for Free and what I understand for the last 30 plus years, it's been a real community building event. And there's been, you know, th this issue just hasn't come up, which is great to see. So I, I'd have a slightly different take, not, not not, a, um, not one contrary, but shall we say just adding a, a different, perhaps, uh, element, which is in my work going down into uh, Dorchester and working also and talking about um, early work in the Bronx, New York, that first of all, I absolutely resonate with the statement. And I think it's fair to say that if you go out and ask poor people, do you want some food waste? The answer is no. It is in the framing. 
If you ask people, you know, hey, you know what, we're gonna go get some stuff out of the trash, um, would you like it? The answer is no, of course not. If you're gonna say, listen, there's, you know, some perfectly healthy good food here that's, that's you know, uh, going to go to waste, that was mango is almost ripe. You know, it's like, would you like a mango that's almost ripe? <laughs> yeah, I like a mango that's almost ripe, uh, et cetera. It's about the framing of are we second class citizens? Are we getting something less than what other people get? Because we feel that, you know, we don't want to get and be treated like second class citizens. It's an issue of dignity, it's an issue of feeling we have a right for something more than that. Which is why in Daily Table, I happen to be, you know, think it's a, of course I do, right? Maslow said that if you're a hammer, all the world's a nail. So I grew up in retail, spent 35 years basically in retail. So retail's the solution for everything, right? And uh, one of the things about retail that I do like is that when I'm down there and they'd say, okay, you talk about affordable nutrition. You talk about, you know, we understand that, you know, we're having a hard time struggling. You get into real conversation with groups often, you know, twice this size down in the community. And they'll start to ask you some really pointed, really tough questions because they're struggling. And it's like, yeah, you talk about all this stuff. Well, what's affordable to you might not be affordable to me. Who defines affordable? And I said, well, here's the nice thing about retail. If I'm selling you something, you define if it's affordable. If I'm giving you a box, I'm just handing you stuff, you didn't choose it. You're gonna come in, you're gonna choose what you want. You're gonna choose if it was healthy, you're gonna choose, or you're gonna choose if it's tasty, first and most important. Is it convenient? Was it easy to use? Was it priced right? Did it seem safe and does it store first rate? Does it look nice? Because that's the other thing he said, we don't want a store that looks like it's, you know, an outlet second rate. You know, we're, we don't, we're kind of against that. We want a first rate looking store. So we've had to spend some money, have to make sure daily table, as little money as possible, looks first rate and doesn't look like it's, you know, a salvage uh, operation. Because it's not what they want, very, very clear. So I think that there is some truth in the fact that, yes, if you just simply frame it up, it's like, you know, you've heard this story that, you know, how many people are in favor of Obamacare? As soon as you call it that, percentage they're in favor. Does. How many people like the Affordable Care Act? Oh yeah, Affordable Care Act, I'm in favor of that. So I think there's a lot about, you know, do poor people want food waste? Do you want, no. Do they want to have access to affordable nutrition? Absolutely, do they want to, do they think food is a resource that shouldn't be wasted? Absolutely. So I think that a lot of it is how we frame it, how we present it, and then it's truly, as Sasha said, it's about the community recognizing that it's a story of us, not a story of them. Clearly, to the degree that I perceive as someone from the outside coming in to solve a problem, it's not embraced. To the degree that we're hiring and we're, we're creating a community from within the community that's solving the problem together, then it's embraced. I, I wanted to kind of give two answers to that. Um, one is almost zooming out one level from our discussion and just think, you know, talking about this food that's getting wasted. So we talked about, you know, again, 33 to 40 percent of the food. So who do you think is impacted um, by our agricultural system? Who's most impacted by the negative externalities, by pesticide runoff, fertilizer runoff, by climate change, by all of these sort of negative environmental impacts? People who are poor, people who are in, in less well-resourced communities. So to the extent that we're not eating 40% of our food, we're putting all of these costs onto these communities to then just throw that food away. So I think that food justice component of this starts all the way back there. It's before the food even then finds a home at the end. That the, you know, the more we can make that, tighten that system up and make sure that after we spend all these resources to grow that food, that someone will get to eat it, that's so important. And I think on the other side of it, just looking at some of the things we talked about, I mean, yes, we said food in, in America is very cheap, but it's still actually there is some cost to all the food that we throw away. At the retail level in particular, if stores know that a certain amount of food is always going to get wasted, because as Sasha said, at the end of the night, the grocery store still feels like they need to have piles of lettuce and apples and whatnot. So there's a certain amount of, of food that's always gonna get thrown away. They have to build that into their model and charge more to account for that. So there's all these other ways that if we are able to make sure that food doesn't get wasted, 
um, no matter who ends up with that food, we're benefiting, we're benefiting everyone by making sure that the system is not having as many externalities, that food costs the, way that, the right amount that it's supposed to cost. And I think what's been so interesting in having worked with, with Doug is actually um, that so many people actually want to shop at the daily table. So it's meant to serve this community, which it's going to serve, but there's so many people who are saying, I want to buy that food because I also want a better and more sustainable food system. So I think it's sort of, it's not food that not everyone wants. It's great and it's important to get it to the people who are in need of it. But the fact that the food that we're talking about, that, that many people are interested in buying it and eating it, the more that we can put in place things where, where all these people are able to access that to show that this is good, healthy food that everyone wants, I think is really important. Uh, Doug, this is a question for you. Uh, daily table sounds like a fantastic idea, and uh, I'm just curious of actually a couple things. One is, uh, what percent of your costs do you anticipate covering by uh, the retail revenue in the first year or the first few years, um, and, or how, do, how will your revenue model work? Um, and also, uh, since you, it seems like it's a mission-driven organization, are you and planning to hold the organization accountable for specific like health outcomes or whatnot of the population that you're serving? Um, just beyond like the n numbers of pounds served or people that come through. Yeah, two, two great questions, thank you. Um, so first, those of you who have, you know, at Harvard I learned all about the theory of change and logic chain and all that stuff. So uh, first and foremost, very few companies, and certainly not at the size of Sasha's or Daily Table, can afford to do the, in the thorough social impact sort of stuff. That's extremely difficult. Even outcomes are tough when you're talking about one factor on an ocean of factors. So daily table, you have to eat some meals there. We say, you know, we're, we're, if, if we're able to get customers to regularly just eat dinner, but maybe they eat lunch somewhere else and they have something else for breakfast. So we're, we're nudging them and helping them, but it's extremely difficult. But here's the real fundamental thing. In the focus groups that we did, we were told in no uncertain to, terms two things. One, question was, who can shop here? And you know, so the question was, well, who do you think should shop here? How would you like it? Well, if it's only a store for the poor, I'm not coming. Because I don't want to be seen walking in there by my neighbors that, oh, you must be poor. You know, everybody should be able to shop here. If everybody can't shop here, you're not going to get your target audience. They didn't put it in that terms. So that, was, that was the answer. We're, you know, we're not going to come. Second thing was, uh, interestingly enough, that our model was really designed around, as I said, trying to be a Trojan horse for health outcomes as retail, to meet them where they needed to be met, and that they did not want, and they said, I don't want this to feel like a program store. If I come in, because I originally were thinking, oh, you know, on Saturdays we'll, we'll have someone from Cobb Square Health Center up here to measure your BMI and, you know, get cholesterol and, you know, and maybe even be pre-diabetic and come on in kind of like the health clinic store. We'll, we'll help, we're on your partner to get you. To, and it was like a no way. If you do that, I'm not coming. You know, I don't want to be reminded of my problems when I walk in here. I, I, don't talk to me about illness and morbidity issues and obesity and um, that the food's killing me that I'm eating and that stuff. You do that, I'm not coming. Negative, negative, negative. Instead, talk to me about my kids are going to do their best, feel their best. So I've kind of come up with these two lame kind of marketing things in my mind. I don't know if we'll use them yet. One is that we create food to die for, not die from. Uh, and the <laughs> other is uh, that uh, we like... We're, we're trying to create food that moves you forward, doesn't hold you back. And it's ways in which they said, don't talk to us about nutritious. That's the N word. Honestly, if someone said, don't use the N word. And I was like, did someone use the N word? <laughs> it's like, yeah, not that nutritious thing, you know, because that just turns us off. So it's really interesting. I just say that because it was such a learning for me how sensitive, uh, what the sensitivities were. In this particular population, I'm not saying that's everybody, but in these, this community in Dorchester where we're going in, that community had a real sensitivity that, one, we want everyone to shop there, two, we don't want to feel like we're part of your program. Now, as it turns out, in order for us to get our 501c3 with IRS, it's a membership store, and we limit it to zip tracking. If you're not in zips that are economically challenged, you can't shop with us. 
But anyone in those zips, and those zips include, by the way, Ashmont Hill, which has million dollar homes and, and other things. So there are plenty of people that are economically, you know, middle class or, or higher, but the majority of the population by far is our target audience. And um, because we're going to have free membership, we're going to be able to track. It's kind of a backdoor way. It wasn't what we intended. But the idea is, you know, this is, this is how we're able to provide the service to the community. Just give us, you know, a zip code you, you live or work in and a phone number to tie that to. You don't need a membership card. We'll just tie it in. Just, but now we'll actually be able to know how many times you come, what you buy, and we'll be able to come back and follow that up with uh, Harvard School of Public Health talking, you know, about ways in which they can take that data and come back and say it did at these outcomes. Economically, you know, ideally, we'll be break even. It is, an, it is a nonprofit. Our intention and our mission is not to make money. Our intention and our mission is to deliver affordable nutrition even if we lose money and have to go out and fundraise. I hope we don't have to do much fundraising other than the initial you know, brick and mortar to build the store out. I hope it gets up and running and we're able to recover uh, costs that are close to what they are. But we want to pay people well. We want to have them have benefits. We're paying at or higher than the competitive in the marketplace. So you can either get a job at KFC across the street from us or at Daily Table. Well, we want to pay better than KFC with better benefits. And guess what? You get to have a mission you're proud of. So that's, the, that's kind of the target. It's all very idealistic. It's all wonderful. And we're perfect right now because we haven't opened yet. So uh, when we're open, you know, then and rubber hits the road, it'll be interesting to see if it works. Awesome. Thanks. I, my question is for Emily, but I just wanted to mention just very briefly, I moved to London a couple of years ago, and I remember the first time I went to the market, I was looking for the eggs, and I was looking in the refrigerator section, and I couldn't find them, and I said, where are the eggs? And they said, oh, they're over there with the baking supplies on the shelf. And it just blew my mind, because for me, eggs are refrigerated, and that's required, and otherwise they'll go bad. But over there, they don't refrigerate their eggs. And my question is, when you had these findings about the date, the meanings behind the dates and the misunderstanding that people have about them, has there been any kind of consumer education campaign about it? Is anyone working to spread the news about that? And is there anything we can do to help, I guess? That's a great, great question. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so what was so interesting, our report when we came out, coming from, we're, we're at a law school, we're very focused on the law and the policy, so we wrote this great report that went through all these things and we said, and here's the policy change, and it got a lot of press, like there was a lot of news coverage, it was really great, all of the news coverage was really about the consumer, it was, hey moms at home, here's how you can waste less food. That is very, very important. I'm glad that it got the press that it did. I'm glad that message got out. The problem with a one-time thing like that with this message getting out was that it doesn't change things over time. It's not like we can every year you know, have more news reminding people about that again. And one of the biggest challenges with our current, uh, with our current lack of date label system, I, I won't even call it a system because it's not well thought out, is that it's impossible to do consumer awareness and consumer education because the dates all say different things and they may or may not mean different things and they may look different in different states. There's no education that, that we can kind of put out a message on a federal level. That's one of the benefits if we change the policy to have one standard label is that then we can say to everyone, Americans, here's this label, here's what it means. If you see this other label on that small, as I mentioned, that small class of food where it might be safety, this is what this means, this is what you should do. And I think if, you know, you can see when, you know, USDA or, um, I think USDA probably is the best guidance on date labels. Uh, and basically they say, if your food expires on this date, if you're keeping it, if it's a refrigerated food and you keep it refrigerated, it still should be good. So that is meant to help people, but I think it's been hard to do consumer awareness. Um, that said, we are working on legislation. We were approached uh, by some, some um, congressmen and representatives saying, we, what can we do? We want to change this. Um, we're working on that and to get to sort of try to reframe this message and make this about policy. And this is a place where we can, you know, it's a win-win-win for everyone if we change this. We're working on a small film right now, which we're, we're really excited to be, to be doing this, like, opinionated documentary kind of talking about this and trying to get that message out. So 
that hopefully will come out this year and will be alongside this campaign to actually get this policy change at the federal level. So you mean an educated, informed, not opinionated, educated, informed, <laughs> educated, informed, and opinionated also. <laughs> fair and balanced. <laughs> yes, and fair and balanced. Yes, thank you. But I'm glad you asked because I think when we do this, we are going to need as many people, everyone in this room, and your friends and your families everyone who cares about this, we're gonna need a push to say, this doesn't make sense. And this is just the beginning. We, in the US, are so far behind other countries on looking at food waste. We've, we, we, we're, we're doing very little compared to, you mentioned London, the UK has done so much. They've had education and campaigns and they've been tracking data and are really saying, we have a national mission to avoid this. France also has a national mission to avoid food waste. In the US, we don't have a national mission to do much with regard to food, but certainly not to avoid food waste, and we think that we should. I just I have to speak to the egg thing, because I had recently looked into that, and just so people do know. In this country, it's about how the eggs are prepped. So here we do this washing of eggs, which makes them more susceptible, which is why they tend to get refrigerated here. If you get farm fresh eggs here, you can leave them on the counter forever because they don't have that processing. So I know that's not what this is about, but I just discovered that because I never understood it myself. There's your answer. And I will say that the, for the first 12 years I was with Trader Joe's, they were unrefrigerated, and they were, they were not in refrigeration. And what happened was there was somewhere in America a salmonella uh, issue with someone that had an issue with eggs with salmonella, and suddenly everyone refrigerated their eggs. And now you'd be terrified to buy an egg in America that wasn't refrigerated. Uh, it's a great panel, and I want to thank all of you for the work that you're doing, because it's really important. So, Emily, when you're talking about legal barriers to sharing food and, and nutrition, I was thinking about breastfeeding, which is uh, an area that I do some writing on uh, called like first food justice, right? And one of the problems is when women have trouble breastfeeding, it's not easy to access excess breast milk from other women because there's a huge regulation uh, system in place where it's incredibly expensive. So it's also elitist as well as inaccessible for almost everybody. I was wondering if that's anything that anyone's approached you about or your clinic has thought about doing. That's a great question. We actually have, that's not been something that's been present in our work, although we um, as a component of our clinic, we have a fellow in the Mississippi Delta. So I mentioned earlier today when, in my welcome that that was where I got started doing food-related work. And our fellow there actually has been working a lot on breastfeeding policy because it's so important, and particularly in low-income communities, it's free food that, that can get to kids that's so important and nutritious. And in those same communities are actually often the communities that get the least resources and knowledge and advice about breastfeeding. Um, but on this topic, I don't. I, it's not something that I know that much about. But I think you're right that it's sort of, you know, if we're talking about food all across the food chain and for all kind of ages, and um, that it's something that that that's worth looking at and what the regulations are and how do we make sure that we're doing it justly. We should talk more. Thank you. Thank you as well for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, my name is Erin Schultz, and I'm a student at the business school. So I'm actually really curious if. Doug and Sasha, y'all can talk a little bit about some of this tension between having nonprofit models of doing this and competing for fundraising dollars versus for-profit models, and if there were other models that you see of being able to actually capture more food waste either on the nonprofit side or on the for-profit side that you have both considered and, and think there's potential to be doing in the market. I'll start and Sasha can finish that. So. Daily Table's nonprofit, not because I thought that nonprofits are better or more pure or that they uh, are, are, are just and for-profit companies are unjust. It was because of the Section 170 enhanced deduction that if we weren't a nonprofit, then those who were going to give us food couldn't take advantage of that enhanced tax deduction. There was also some feeling that in the community for coming down for a nonprofit it would be a little easier to uh, be embraced with the idea we're not trying to make money off of them, selling them food that at the time I thought was going to be, I was going to have to push hard on this expired, you know, food, you know, stuff past its display code. Turns out probably the vast majority of what we'll sell, if not almost all of it, will be within code because we're cooking up and preparing probably 75% of our sales will all have 14 days on it or so, because we're cooking it fresh in the, in the spot. 
But I do think that uh, uh, I know the, the people that uh, started B Lab really well. I think the B Corps and, and, and that idea, the, uh, the social um, uh, contract that a number of uh, states have different ones. I think there's 31 or 35 states now that allow for a corporation, a for-profit corporation, to have a social benefit uh, charter that says that investors can get a return on their money, but their return is then either tied to a certain set uh, percentage or based upon the social benefit that, it's almost like social contract bonds. You've probably heard of those also. Uh, out of, I think it started in England, but there's some here now. So there's a lot of different ways that we can hybrid. Uh, to some degree, Panera, for instance, uh, Ron Shake, who I've had a chance to get to know through my work at Conscious Capitalism. Ron, uh, you know, Panera Cares, which is the Panera where you walk in, you pay what you want. And they're in areas that are on the edge of, of tough parts of town. They're not in the heart of tough parts of town, because as he said, frankly, just they wouldn't work there. So he puts them on the edge where 20% of the shoppers come in, pay more, 60% pay whatever you ask, and 20% pay nothing. And so that model works well to be a break even. Um, so it's kind of a hybrid, and that, because the Panera Care is a nonprofit within Panera, which is a for profit. So I think there's all kinds of models out there that can be very innovative, hybrids, and whether you're B Corp, for profit, nonprofit. To me, what it's really about is are you efficient? Are you effective? Are you utilizing? Well, are you meeting customers' needs? It's all the market-based sort of stuff. At the end of the day, funders run, they get fatigued, just as investors do. If you have a for-profit that has to keep coming back to the well because you're not getting traction with a customer and giving them a service they want, investors also get fatigued and go, we're done giving money. Funders the same way. If, you, if it looks like you're not making a significant contribution to the challenges, funding tends to be a very competitive market. So I, I just simply say that I think that each of the models can be great. It all depends upon how you approach it, what your purpose is, and what the, what the design uh, uh, and the intent is. I definitely, uh, I think that if you're serving the people that Food for Free is serving, for example, and potentially even the people that Doug are serving, so working poor people, depending on, if you're serving a, a population that doesn't necessarily have money to make that profit for you. It, it, you're taking some risk if you're setting yourself up to have that tension of I need to make a profit to stay in business and I have to, if the people that are paying me are folks without money, it's a challenge. Not to say it can't be done. I agree with Doug that whether you're not for profit or um, a B Corp or a corporation isn't necessarily the point. There is the question of where is the funding coming from? One of the things I think longer term could potentially happen with the help of, of laws or incentives. If you look at the retail stores, the, the supermarkets that we go to, they get a significant tax deduction for giving us the food that they give us. They also stop paying significant waste hauling costs and composting costs. My opinion, running a nonprofit that's picking all that food up, is that there's some money right there, okay? That, and all of that benefit financially is going back to the retail store and not towards covering any of the costs to, to getting that food back into the community. And I think, you know, I don't blame the retail stores as it is, that's how it's set up, and, and they, they are driven by profit and shareholders. But I do think that there is plenty of room there to get more creative about how we as a community or as a nation address food waste as a national challenge, not as, oh, these poor people need food. That's not the issue. The issue is that food waste affects everybody, and it's environmental, it's everything else, and it's the responsibility as a nation to deal with it. So I think that's where there could be some room to at least deal with the funding, whether it's to a non not-for-profit or to a for-profit. I wanted to jump into really quick on that point. It's not necessarily about the structuring, the sort of like food recovery middleman, you know, what Sasha and Doug do, but um, on the the, the um, retailer or, or um, private actor themselves, Massachusetts has passed a really interesting law that went into effect this fall, which I think is sort of in the background of, of, of some of our work, but we failed to mention, that they now uh, ban uh, uh, an institution from sending more than one ton of food waste or food a week to landfills. 
So this has been an interesting regulation. There's a few other states that have ones like this, but the idea is basically this is the responsibility of everyone, and we're going to put some burden back on those private retailers or institutions to say, you can't just keep sending food to landfills. Once it's in landfills, it's one of the biggest contributors to methane, which is a really bad greenhouse gas. For all the reasons we've talked about, it shouldn't be in a landfill anyway. So it's been an interesting law because they're basically saying, we're going to put, we're going to re require all these private businesses to change their habits so that this doesn't happen. Reducing the amount of waste they have in the first place, getting it to people in need. One of the challenges, I think, is that um, a lot of it, I think, will end up in, in compost, which is great, much better than a landfill. But I think all of us here, obviously, are of the mind that the more of that that can go to people, the better. So this law doesn't actually have any incentive. They don't care where the food goes as long as it's not the landfill. But maybe it was starting with this as a baseline. And now there's a real incentive, not just with these hauling fees to the landfill that Sasha mentioned, but also you're going to get fined if you have this waste to, to sort of come in and say, let's set up all these systems. Let's make a better process where we can get that to people that need it. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, great. Um, hi, my name is Andy, and I am serving as an AmeriCorps volunteer this year. Um, my question is mostly, well, first, thank you. I'm really excited about all the work you guys are doing. Um, is mostly for Doug and Sasha, but so you guys are doing amazing work to really make a more efficient food system, but in what you're doing, you're inevitably going to have waste of your own, um, and what do you directly do with it, like, in your business? I mean, I'll start just because we're already doing something with it, I'm sure. Yeah, we're Doug. perfect. <laughs> right, we don't have any waste. That's, so it's a timely question. Um, so we actually used to, so our building, if you, if you know Central Square, there's Inman Street and there's City Hall. We're right, there's a house right behind City Hall, a big white house, and that's, that's where we're housed. It's owned by the Cambridge Economic Opportunity Committee and they give us space there. And we've been there, as far as I know, for 30 years. And we used to have a big compost pile in the back of, um, we have a backyard but there were rat issues, among other things. So that went away. We've tried all these different things. Many of my drivers would go to Whole Foods down the street and put the compost there. Because what you're talking about is Whole Foods pulls a bunch of stuff from the shelves. They, they compost some of it. They give it all to us. We then sift. Some of it really isn't good enough to pass on. We have to get rid of it. We pass it on to the food pantries, meal programs. There's another step there and probably another step with this. So there, so there is waste all along the way. Um, we were trying to bring it down to the Whole Foods composter, and it, it was too much. I mean, it shouldn't matter, right? It was their food to begin with, but I understand. So the city of Cambridge is, is starting to compost. They're, they're starting a program where they're actually covering composting for us because we, we um, share the building with a food pantry, which a lot of our food goes to, and it is amazing. You know, we're talking about reducing this waste. It doesn't entirely reduce it, and coming out of that food pantry and coming out of food for free is far more compost you know, than ever leaves my house. So it is a lot. We are at least composting it. Um, and I think that's, oh, actually, one other thing we do in the summer is when we go to the Copley Farmer's Market, it was we bring a bunch to a pig farmer there so that that person can take it back. But there is, at the end of the day, organic waste. And um, it isn't, you know, it's not food at that point. It, it's food. It's not edible food. We've thought a lot about this because one of the things we want to make sure is we're not going around spending money to collect food to then just ourselves end up tossing it and having it being wasted. And so one of the keys is, as Emily's talked about, is that you know we have to change customers' perceptions of what, what a store should look like an hour before they close. Because in England, uh, first time I went to Marks and Spencer, I walked in about two and a half hours before they closed. This is in the uh, mid-80s. And the place looked like it was going out of business. It was gutted. And the, the perishable sections were, were, I mean, they were like, I thought they were doing a remodel. Like, <laughs> I even actually went up to someone, found an employee, said, so, hey, what's going on? He said, what do you mean? I said, Snowstorm. it's like, yeah, is it the Cuban Missile Crisis? Did I miss something? <laughs> and he said, no, no, come on back tomorrow morning. You know, it'll be stock free full. I said, yeah, but right now, he said, well, isn't it, yeah, we're, isn't that great? We sold out. Mm -hmm. It's like. Yeah, that's great, but you're missing sales, you know, and it's that sort of, you're missing sales. That's the, the, that's the um, retail facing. Customer facing though is that, as Sasha said, or as Emily said, I think it was Sasha that said that if you're in there and you're not stocking mm -hmm. the product at 8.30 at night and I come back in several times, you don't have lettuce, I'm going to your competitor. So one thing we're gonna do is we have a commitment among our team 
that we're not going to produce only what we think we can sell and get rid of, and we're going to have dynamic pricing. Because we don't have to, because we are designed around affordable nutrition, and we've already done studies out there, by the way, fast food isn't cheap. <laughs> big, big breaking news to everybody. <laughs> Turns out when you go out and study, what do you actually get at KFC and Burger King and all this stuff? For, forget about the cost per nutrient, because there's not a lot of nutrients paying a lot for it, but just even just cal calorically what you pay, it's not that cheap. Uh, but so our whole goal is and our promise is we will be less than that. But more importantly, if we get out a batch of product and it's three in the afternoon and we're not going to sell it, it's, you know what, everyone comes in and gets one free because we need to get rid of this. We want to get rid of this. We, want, we also believe that if someone comes home and tries this product, they're going to think it's delicious. So it's like, it's like demo. Hey, hey, buy this, get one free because we got too many of them. So I think that we're committed to try to make certain that we have as little as possible. There will be product. We'll bring wherever we get it. We'll get product to come back, and it's just, it's not, you can't cook it. You can't do anything with it. It'll become organic waste. There's nothing we can do. But we do know from, we've already recovered over, well, we have right now storing from when we open about 40,000 pounds of what we've gleaned from farms, produce, et cetera. And we've probably recovered about 70,000 pounds of which we, what we can't use because they've given us everything, we've taken stuff. We've then given to other agencies and other, uh, uh, everything from food bank to, you know, NECAP that can use it. So our intent is to try to reach out that if we get something we can't use, well, who else can use it? And make, know right away that we get more than we can use, instead of going, oh gosh, we can't deal with someone else because who knows, maybe then they'll go right directly to our source. It's going, no, let's, let's call somebody else that they can use this product. And so I called us. We We've received yeah. stuff from you And you've, you've received some stuff. And, yeah. and so I think that the more that we as, as organizations that are in this field stop siloing, working together, you know, in ways that make sense, uh, not being Pollyannish, just ways that make sense, I think that um, we strengthen each other. And then I think that actually the system itself uh, works better. Thank you very much. So right before you guys leave, um, yes, thank you to our wonderful presenters. Thank you, Ona. <laughs> and a quick plug for Boston area attendees. In two weeks, we are screening Just Eat It. It is a new documentary about food waste. It is touring the world right now, and the producers are coming Monday, April 13th, 5 to 7 p.m. here in the law school, uh, and we're really excited to have them here. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks.